Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our chambers. We have three public meetings on our agenda this evening, and I would like to call our first public meeting to order. We have our land acknowledgement for Centre Wellington. We are meeting on lands that have been home to Indigenous nations since time immemorial. We acknowledge we are on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee. With increasing encroachment by non-Indigenous settlers in the area now known as the Township of Centre Wellington, the Mississaugas could not continue their traditional lifestyle and retreated to villages along the Credit River, eventually settling in the Grand River Valley. The Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation uphold their treaty rights within our jurisdiction. Today, the Township of Centre Wellington remains home to Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to share and respect Mother Earth and are committed to building constructive and cooperative relationships with Indigenous nations. Now I'm going to ask for any declarations of pecuniary interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, except we're going to be asking them for all three public meetings so that we can declare now for the three meetings this evening. Bronwyn. Oh, sorry, Councillor Wilton. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Jefferson. Uh, I have conflict with the second and third public meetings, RZ0522 South River Road Youngblood property and RZ02022 7450 Middlebrook Road Pilkington. Uh, that is due to my spouse being a partner at MHBC Planning and MHBC is providing planning services for both of these applications. Okay. Thank you, Bronwyn. Any other declarations? Okay, seeing none. <clears throat> so the purpose of this public meeting is to present and receive public input regarding a proposed zoning bylaw amendment on the subject land known as 465 Garifraxa Street West in Fergus. The purpose of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is to change the zoning of the subject land from FD future development to R4 residential exception. The effect of the amendment is to implement zoning regulations necessary to facilitate the development of a stacked townhouse condominium development habitat for humanity. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at the public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of Centre Wellington before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Township of Centre Wellington to the Ontario Land Tribunal, the OLT. If a person or public body does not make su oral submission at the public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of Centre Wellington before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the OLT unless, in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. If anyone wishes to be notified of the adoption of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, a written request must be filed with the municipal clerk at Township of Centre Wellington, 1 Macdonald Square, Alora, Ontario, N0B1S0. And then at this time, I will ask the municipal clerk to advise how a notice was given. Uh, through you, notice was mailed to prescribe persons, agencies, and public bodies on or before March the 2nd, 2023. A copy was also published in the Wellington Advertiser on March the 2nd, 2023. I can therefore confirm the requirement for giving notice was completed on March the 2nd, 2023. Thank you, Carrie. <clears throat> So now I will call on Andrew Head and Brock Lintletter from Dryden Smith Head Planning Consultants to provide an overview of the development. Hi, and welcome. Good evening, my name is Andrew Head. I'm here from Dryden Smith and Head Planning Consultants. I'm here on behalf of Habitat for Humanity for this evening's public meeting. <clears throat> okay, I got this. All right. <clears throat> uh, thank you for this evening. I'm um, just taking this quick moment. Uh, what we're here for this evening is a zoning bylaw amendment application for 465 Garifraxa Street West in Fergus for Habitat for Humanity. <coughs> the proposal is to modify the zoning bylaw 
of 4,181 meters squared of vacant land from future development to residential R4 lands to allow for 32 stacked townhouses that will house residential residents who qualify through the Habitat for Humanity program. The subject property is, f is f close to one acre and is part of Block 4, Registered Plan 77, Township of Center Wellington. The existing use in the property is vacant land and is fairly flat with most, mostly void of trees and vegetation. The site is, is accessed through Garifaxa Street West. <clears throat> Services are, to the property are available and will be extended to the site upon once we have approval. The property is located at the westerly edge of Fergus between the Highway 6 and Beatty Line. If you note on the site plan or on the air photography, you can see that the surrounding uses is a mix of low and medium residential to the east and north and open space lands to the west and industrial lands to the south. The, I'm happy to say that this plan is, is in compliance with all of the provincial and local planning documents. The provincial policy statement, growth plan in Greater Golden Horseshoe, the County of Wellington official plan and the Township of Center Wellington official plan as well. The property is currently zoned future development in the Center Wellington zoning bylaw. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment, amendment ch change will comply with the policies as set out in the zoning bylaw. Future development zone applies to lands that are part of the urban centers that are expected to be developed or redeveloped for the f in the future but for which further planning review is needed before further development approvals can be granted. Permitted uses are limited to existing uses, buildings, and structures only. The property that we are talking about today is vacant. The development proposal is to convert the vacant land to a 32-unit stack townhouse development for Habitat for Humanity. The current zoning for the property does not permit a stack townhouse development. As a result, the following zoning is being proposed. We're proposing an R4 zoning with site-specific provisions to recognize a couple shortfalls or shortcomings on the site and to allow for better density on, on, the, on the site. One would be noting the interior side yard of 2.3 meters instead of the required three. This is a pinch point between the corner of a building and the property line. The minimum bu building separation is at three meters. It meets fire code and is in generally allows for landscaping between and then the minimum private amenity areas, which we've covered by al allowing private amenity areas as well as some grass amenity areas on site. There's also an issue with um, the minimum grade for private amenity area as well. But we address that through the site plan and elevations. <clears throat> this is a general idea of what the uh, project is going to look like when it's completed. We will have, uh, as, you on, as, as noted on the site plan, we have 45 parking spaces are required. We currently are providing 47 parking spaces. The unit breakdown for these units, this is the nice part actually because everybody, that I, as a development planner, I see a lot of one bedroom and two bedroom stuff going out there. This is where it gets nice. We're planning 14 four bedroom units, 14 three bedroom units, and four two bedroom units. This is one of the mixes that we need in this community for habitat for people who have bigger families. This is like, I, I really take joy in this part because this is the kind of thing that, we, that I get to do for the community and get to give back a little bit, seeing something nice for our, our community. So to conclude, <clears throat> the zoning bylaw amendment represents smart planning by providing affordable housing units through the Habitat for Humanity program. The proposed development is consistent with provincial policies and conforms to all applicable planning policy documents. By increasing density and introducing a mixture of unit types, the proposed development will introduce several first-time home buyers to the market. Located at the fringe of the development limit, it is a natural progression for development, and it's located within the urban built boundary. This proposed development intensifies an existing and underutilized greenfield site and will contribute to the mix of housing units and types. With me tonight, I have uh, Brock from my office, as well as uh, Brett Daw and Steve Howard from Habitat for Humanity, and we'd welcome any questions. Okay, so we'll move to delegations. Alrighty, that's great. Thank you for your presentation. 
Um, there are no registered uh, delegations for this this evening, but I will ask if there's anybody in the chambers that would like to speak to this application. Oh, yes, please come forward. I have to get her name. I was just thinking of it now. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome. We will have you state your name for record, and okay. then we will also just specify that we're doing with delegations a 10-minute okay. time to speak, and then I'll give you a one-minute notice. Okay, thank, thank you. you. My name is Kathy Baranski. I live at 335 Garofraxis Street West. Um, I am not opposed to this, this development in any way, but I do have a couple of concerns. Um, Garofraxis Street, since the Storybrook subdivision has been developed, has become very, very busy. And when I am, have looked through the, this application, I notice that there doesn't appear to be any sidewalks that are going to be built along Garofraxis Street. And because particularly of the uh, indication that families are going to live here with a four-bedroom and three-bedroom, I'm very concerned about not having sidewalks at least on one side of the street. Uh, there's no way for the kids to get to school or to the park unless they walk right on Garofraxis Street. So that is one of my main concerns about this development. And also it looks like there is very little green amenity space. Um, I know that there is a uh, stormwater pond behind the building, but it looks like there's only two small triangles that are going to be amenity space. And again, with four bedrooms and three bedrooms, there doesn't look to be any space for kids to play. There is a park on Garofraxis Street, but they can't access it safely without sidewalks. Uh, the open space could potentially be a great play area, but it's not right now very well maintained. And so, you know, maybe there's some plan that could develop that as a bit more of a green space for that development. The other concern I have is that the stormwater pond, which is directly behind this, which is the open space area, collects water from about, well, a very large acreage. With the paving um, of this area and the building on this area, a lot of the water runoff will enter into the stormwater pond. From that stormwater pond, there's a stormwater um, water course that goes right through my backyard. Uh, it looks like a small creek and it's open. Um, at this point, when we have big storms, a lot of rain, melting snow in the spring, this uh, water course floods somewhat and it can come very close to the back of my deck. Um, I'm really concerned that there has to be some uh, mitigation from the parking lot area and from the uh, uh, downspouts from the building so that all of that water is not going to run into the stormwater pond and then through the water course at the same time. I know that the stormwater pond has gates in it that can go up and down. They're never ever utilized so perhaps it's something the town staff has to look at maybe managing that flooding a little bit more carefully. Uh, uh, that's all I have to say. Great, thank you. I don't you. know any, and if I can answer any questions, I'd be happy to. Okay, um, we will actually do questions from council just shortly. Okay. Um, any other delegates? I would do one more call. For okay, thank you, Kathy. I'm just gonna do another call out if there's any other delegates that would like to speak to this application. Uh, good evening. Um, my question's more oh, so just... sorry. Can oh. I just get your name for the record? Yeah, my name's Will. Thank you. Last name? Sherman. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question's just, um, I was just curious the phase two environmental findings, um, if any, uh, just what they were, and that's my question. Great, thanks. And is there anybody else in the room that would like to speak to this application? 
Okay, if not, um, there's a few concerns there. So we will ask the um, applicant if you'd like to come back to respond to them. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, quick one. Record site condition? We're all good. No concerns. It's absolutely, we have a, we have a clean site. Phase one and two. That's uh, it was a big concern. Uh, we did our due diligence before the final purchase of this property was completed, and we're happy to report our phase two come back clean. Uh, so that's one. As far as the engineering for sidewalks, um, if uh, you dig a little bit deeper into the report, it is a requirement by the uh, Center of Wellington that we do construct sidewalks that to make it accessible for the site. That. The, the greens, oh, stormwater management, our site will be controlled for engineering. Everything's going to be graded and uh, controlled on site, and it's going to be put out to the legal outlet. We can't legally outlet to uh, the stormwater management pond behind it, so it will be graded and outletted towards Garifraxa. As, if you, as, as it states in the engineering reports, it will be graded and it will be controlled. As far as the green space goes, sometimes we have to look at uh, the greater good, and what we do have, we had to find a, a balance to where we can get some units to make the financial viability of the site. We are dealing with a delicate nature here, being in a habitat build. Uh, we don't have the luxuries of chasing all the big dollars, right? So how do we balance the numbers is one of the concerns. So trying to get a good yield on the site, still providing uh, green space. There has to be a little bit of shortfall someplace. And um, this is, well, the development kind of works where it is. There's, with the private amenity spaces and the green space available, we feel that it is, is enough. We have the linkages and the sidewalks available to help the community um, or the pedestrians navigate to the, the local park as well. That was everything. And I'll just ask you to remain. We're going to turn over and have questions from the council. So if that's okay. Sure. All righty. Uh, Councillor McDonald. Through you, Deputy Mayor Jefferson, <coughs> thank you so much. Uh, you answered a few questions there um, with regards to the green space was there consideration of a future little park or something you know when I look at it because um, as someone who is very passionate about parks in the community I'm not saying habitat should put one in I'm just asking the question if there's room to collaborate with a group about it later or yeah, th there's definitely been discussions about us putting in like a tot lot or something like that so that there is a play area or play structures. Um, that is not off the books at all. Uh, it is something that Habitat is aware of. They want to provide that kind of things for their community and for their residents, right? So it is definitely a consideration and we're looking into it, okay? Great. Um, Mayor Waters, would you have a question at all? No, not a question. No? Okay. Councillor Eboy? Thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor Jefferson, thank you. A uh, huge fan and supporter of Habitat for Humanity, and I really want to celebrate that we have all kinds of options for housing, including uh, different sized rooms, which uh, one of my colleagues brought up at a recent mo at a recent meeting here. So I really celebrate that, as well as affordable and attainable housing. And frankly, I wish this were a version of this were a model of all. Uh, communities as we move forward. My question is around um, active transportation. Now, I used to personally walk the makeshift trail that are on either side of that. Is there any discussion around creating or uh, making a firm trail so that we can have active transportation options, especially to find a way to get the kids to the, to the park that is currently on Garifrax out of reach? Well, I believe the trail network is owned by the, the Township Center Wellington, and with that being that, it would be up to them to do any upgrades. They have not, we have not received comments back to us. Um, we're going to try to avoid paying for any upgrades to that trail, I'm sure, just because it is quite cost sensitive. Uh, it is a trail network, and hopefully with the increase of popula uh, in the, the increased density in the neighborhood, maybe that will become a hotter topic around the council table to bring something like that to, to fruition. Thank you. Councillor Adams, questions? Yes, through you, Deputy Mayor. I actually just did have one question. Um, I want to thank Kathy. I think those were great concerns yeah. to being brought forward. I think there are a lot of the concerns that we had, and you answered them great, I think. Um, my question is, is, so you would plan so that that green space could be built on on a future date, and am I right to assume that that could even come through like a corporate donation? Uh, I'm going to actually just, uh, th sorry, through, through you, Madam Chairman, um, through, th I'm going to divert this back over to Mr. Mr. Steve Howard. Um, the top uh, sure. donations, how, do, how does that work? Uh, 
you want me to come up there? So I think I've been introduced, but I'm Steve Howard. Um, typically for that um, kind of activity, we would invite service clubs to join us. Um, in fact, we've already had, I think, three service clubs offer to participate on the project in one way or another. So um, once we're further down the road, we'll bring them into the process. Okay. Councillor Wilton. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Jackson. Uh, just a question, if you caught the meeting Monday night, you might know where this is going, but I'm curious about storage for uh, bicycles or parking for bicycles, and if you have a family with four bedrooms, where would they actually keep the stuff to get them from schools and back and things like that, so thank you. That is an excellent question. Um, I expect that uh, bicycle storage was, was, was not mentioned. Um, we, have, we haven't applied for site plan yet. Right, so this in, the, in, the, this in these initial steps, it is always a thought for uh, a cyclist, and uh, they are a big ticket item, as you can see from everywhere that we, we go. Cycling is, is becoming a bigger bigger item for all of us, and uh, I expect right now, at this point in time, we have not provided for bicycle storage on site, as it, has, it is not a requirement for us. We're meeting parking; it's not like we're looking for a reduction in parking. So, and it, it's not. I don't know if it's considered a, a mode for transportation where we are located. But I expect the balconies and the private amenity spaces would probably add for where you, where people would keep their bicycles at this point in time. That is just kind of a blanket slate, and we can we can look deeper into that once we go through site plan. Uh, at the process there, we'll have to deep, do a deeper dive into that. Okay. Councillor Cranick. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, did I read correctly that the seven accessible units would be only be available for three bedroom? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And then I think maybe this next would be more towards you, Stephen. But um, in regards to the organization, I know this is very early on, but how do you qualify the individuals that would potentially occupy the units? And, and, and maybe how would they go about applying? Um, individuals are income qualified. Um, we have uh, cutoffs that are determined by uh, the province of Ontario. It's called low income cutoffs. Um, they're published annually. So we have to adhere to those guidelines for habitat families. We support them by um, second mortgages and interest free mortgages. Um, in terms of qualifying the families, we've already received about 90 applications for this site. Um, so um, we go through a process of making sure that they will succeed in the program, um, that they're willing to commit um, 500 hours of volunteer services. Once they, once they meet those criteria, we operate on a first come, first serve basis. And through you, Deputy Mayor, follow up. Um, I was reading more into the organization and saw that just this month the federal government had put $25 million towards 500 new homes, I think it was. Right. Um, will those funds be applicable to this project? Yeah. Um, through our national body, we have a partnership with CMHC. Um, so there will be uh, $50,000 per unit coming into this project. And just a follow-up comment. I think it's like such a uh, good thing that you guys are doing to create sustainable solutions that's like it's for affordable housing and much needed in our area so thank you thank you we feel it is too thanks very much great thank you any further questions from council no okay thank you madam chair members of council and staff thank you very much thank you all righty I would like to thank everybody for attending this first public meeting of the evening and I will advise that council will be considering the bylaw at a future council meeting. So I will declare this first public meeting adjourned.
Alrighty. Okay, so I would like to call our second public meeting this evening to order, and we'll go right into the purpose of the meeting. So the purpose of this public meeting is to present and receive public input regarding a proposed zoning bylaw amendment on the subject land known as 273240 Broken Foot Path and 11 Gilkinson Street in Alora. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment seeks to revise the boundary between the R1A 5814 Residential Exception Zone and the OS Open Space Zone. The intent of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is to adjust the boundary of the OS zone to create a lateral woodland corridor along South River Road and to facilitate a more efficient design for the development of residential Block 5. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at the public meeting or make written submissions at the Township of Centre Wellington before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Township of Centre Wellington to the Ontario Land Tribunal, which is the OLT. If a person or public body does not make oral submission at the public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of Centre Wellington before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body may not be added as the party to the hearing of an appeal before the OLT unless, in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. If anyone wishes to be notified of the adoption of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, a written request must be filed with the Municipal Clerk, Township of Centre Wellington, at 1 McDonald Square, Alora, Ontario, N0B1S0. And at this time, I will ask the municipal clerk to advise how notice was given. Uh, through you, notice was mailed to prescribed persons, agencies, and public bodies on or before March the 2nd, 2023. A copy was also published in the Wellington Advertiser on March the 2nd. I can therefore confirm the requirement for giving notice was completed on March the 2nd, 2023. Thank you, Carrie. And now I will call on Dave Aston from MHBC Planning Consultants to provide an overview of this application. Thank you and welcome. Good evening. Thank you very much. Oh, here we go. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to the application this evening. I'm here with uh, Bruce Youngblood who will help answer any questions as we move forward here. Um, so tonight the request is related to a zoning bylaw amendment that relates to primarily the lands that are shown in red on the slide. Uh, the description of the lands on, uh, in the title of the slide relates to all of the lands and those uh, remaining portions of the lands uh, as you can see there has been a, a lot happening with the subdivisions and the first two phases of the plan of subdivision have recently been registered. So these are lands that are uh, remaining as part of the plan of subdivision. Uh, so the lands are located on the south side of South River Road. Um, they're within the plan of subdivision referred to as blocks five and 11 in the plan of subdivision. Um, as I mentioned, the lands kind of to the south of these lands have been subject to uh, the plan of subdivision final approvals, so all of the conditions have been addressed uh, for those uh, registrations to occur. Um, and this is all uh, a result of a previous approval uh, for the Youngblood subdivision and the lands to the west, which were referred to as the Haylock lands, through uh, the local planning appeals tribunal, which is now the OLT. Uh, in 2018. So the lands, as far as the current policy framework, are located in the Alora Salem Urban Center. Uh, portions of the land are designated uh, green lands by the County of Wellington official plan, not core green lands, but green lands. Um, and that's associated with the woodlands um, over one hectare uh, in relation to the lands and the broader area. Um, the official plan provides for the ability to look at the delineation of woodlands and how they are identified and that they can be refined and considered where detailed studies have been completed. So that's why we're here this evening. We've done work to 
assess the woodlands, and I'll speak to that in, in a moment, um, but refining that woodlands area and the associated open space area uh, with which corresponds to the block on the plan of subdivision. Uh, in the township official plan, the lands are designated residential, <clears throat> so that's all of the yellow area, and the lands are within the built boundary, actually, uh, so any development with it within the area is considered intensification in context of uh, your growth management planning. Uh, their lands are not identified with any core green lands designation in the township official plan. So the proposal, as I mentioned, is to uh, refine the block five limits, which uh, were identified as an open space block, and add a portion of the block five lands to block 11, which are land zoned uh, for a single detached residential through a plan of condominium. So the approval in the past provided for development of the lands with 30 single detached uh, units on a private road in a plan of condominium. So what's being proposed isn't to increase the number of units at all. It's looking at a change to the open space boundary, which will actually assist with a more efficient development pattern of the lands uh, approved for single detached residential, which will then in turn actually allow for a greater ability to grade and save trees within the block 11 or the single detached uh, uh, condominium area. It also result in an enhancement of that open space area because right now it's quite um, uh, overrun by invasive species and there's a, a lot of uh, dead and dying trees within that area. So it provides some opportunity to enhance a 30 meter corridor along South River Road. So this is the current zoning and what's proposed so you can see the open space zone would remain along South River Road and it's it's refined in the in the sense of the switching between the open space zone and the existing residential zone. So in support of this submission environmental analysis was completed uh, by an ecologist and an environmental addendum report was prepared uh, in support of you know the the proposed change to the open space zone. This report was peer reviewed by the township uh, that included site walks and discussions with the township peer reviewer and there's correspondence uh, associated with that. Um, the wooded area uh, on the subject lands was evaluated in context of the Natural Heritage Reference Manual uh, and woodland significance. And the evaluation or conclusions from the environmental report uh, included confirmation or opinion that the woodland contains significant invasive species. So removal and management of, of invasive species is important to occur to maintain the health of that area, and that the health of the woodland is poor and continuing to decline. And that's something that's been occurring since uh, 2018. The report recommends the woodland be retained for a distance of 30 meters along South River Road and to continue to maintain a lateral corridor along South River Road. And that tree inventory and replacement plan uh, is recommended and that could also include an overall management plan associated with enhancement of the area. There was discussion through the various process and meetings uh, that uh, there's willingness to uh, entertain township ownership of that 30 meter uh, corridor along the road as well. I think discussions are still ongoing, but there is a willingness to see that occur as well. So within the corridor, we're talking about a 30 meter corridor. There's uh, some other area kind of in adjacent to the existing stormwater management pond. But this slide is identifying areas where uh, there would be uh, 
trees retained and maintain existing trees and then also opportunity for enhancement so within this area as I mentioned there's there's some good quality species there's a lot of invasive species and there's a lot of dead and dying species so what we've identified here are areas uh, that could be enhanced could be managed and then an overall area of woodland uh, that is proposed uh, to remain at the end of the day uh, should this proposal be considered. So in conclusion, uh, the request this evening is supported by environmental analysis of the woodland area. There's recommendations associated with that proposal. Uh, there's technical peer review that's occurred and, and that included a site visit to understand uh, what was on the ground. And my understanding there's general agreement associated with uh, the conclusions of the health of the woodland and the need to manage that area. Uh, the proposal maintains a woodland corridor around south, along South River Road. Uh, does not result in a change to anything associated with the previous approvals of development in the context of the permissions of uh, single detached units. So it's not resulting in something that's increasing the previous considerations and facilitates a more effective development on the lands that are zoned residential and also provides for an opportunity to manage and enhance that, that corridor and look to introduce better quality native species, shrubs and grasses within that area. So, and that's our pro proposal this evening. We're happy to answer questions and to respond to any comments that may follow. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now we have um, three registered delegations actually that would like to speak to this application as well. Um, so I will call forward um, Eugene Kramer. Good evening. I do just want to remind you that we are allowing 10 minutes for a talk, and then I will give you a one-minute warning. Okay? I'll do my best. Great. Thank you. My name is Eugene Kramer. My wife, Lynn, and I are opposed to the application for rezoning to revise the boundary between Block 5 and Block 11, the open space zone. Lynn and I want to see the degraded woodlot restored to health and open space become a trail linkage to the trails within the Haylock Youngblood subdivisions and other trails in center Wellington. In preparation for this presentation, I used these uh, really excellent CW resources. Um, Number seven, I, we used a lot of that because we live very close to this woodlot. And uh, number seven is believe what I see with my own eyes. I learned about open space and I found this generic definition that I like. I especially like the last point. The OS system typically suggests park needs and improvements and often identifies a trail network to serve the community. CW Trails and Transportation Master Plan reflect this point strongly. This photo shows the tree canopy looking east along South River Road and on the Haylock Youngblood lands before significant tree removal was undertaken. It's remarkable to me how many mature trees are gone today. Can the township or the developer state how many hectares of land were cleared of trees for the subdivisions? And was all the tree removal since the original applications for approval in 2015 on these lands approved by Center Wellington Township and or Wellington County? Before any further removal of trees is considered, the public should know the answers to these questions. This overhead 
uh, view is showing the tree canopy with trees removed on South River Road and near Broken Front Lane for, storm, for the stormwater management feature. As we are asked to focus only on Block 11 of the Youngblood subdivision, let's remember the number of trees already removed from the Haylock Youngblood lands. And more trees will be removed for the residential housing development in Block, nine, uh, block 5, as there's a significant woodlot at the rear of Block 5. And uh, really, all the, uh, the property on the, the Youngblood lands are um, have tree borders, and it's sometimes not easy to see even where the township lands uh, extend into these kind of frontages, such as along South River Road on, on Block 5. The current situation of Block 11 at the time of the LPAT final order in January 2019 has the open space as core greenlands. Nothing changed after those long LPAT deliberations or mediation sessions. And now you are being asked to reduce the size of the open space from 3.612 acres to 2.2 acres. Note its proximity to the stormwater management feature and the trail that wraps around the pond. This open space has already been reduced in size by three quarters of an acre to accommodate the construction of the stormwater management feature. Our number one recommendation to you is to extend the trail that runs from Haylock Avenue parallel to South River Road through the Block 11 woodlot and exit onto the South River Road past the curve at the east boundary of Block 11. There was a development pro proposal uh, written, uh, a paragraph entitled Development Proposal from the uh, 2018 LPAT report that stated, there are three po park blocks proposed, as well as the area designated as core greenlands, which is to function as open space block. This proposal should still st stand firm today in March of 2023. This is another uh, slide showing that current situation as the LPAT order stood on January 8, 2019. The red arrow shows a possible location of a trail extension connecting from the open space trail of the Haylock property and following a hydro line already cut through the open space woodlot in Block 11. Further to our number one recommendation, uh, in, this in this photo, the bench marked by a red arrow is a possible starting point for the trail extension through the Block 11 woodlot following the existing hydro line. The speed limit along Water Street heading east is 40 kilometers per hour and changes to 60 kilometers per hour just before the Block 11 woodlot, as shown in this picture. Typically, cars are accelerating as they approach Broken Front Lane and the curve on South River Road. It is time to extend the 40 kilometer per hour further along South River Road heading east. Further on, recommendation number one, this is the hydro line that cuts through the open space woodlot. The trail extension that is our number one recommendation could follow this hydro line. And this photo shows the line running through a stand of healthy white pines. Believe what your eyes can see. The key statement that came from the um, LPAT 2018 report and addresses the need for planning safe streets and facilitating active transportation and community con connectivity. Extending a trail through the open space woodlot and lowering the speed limit would allow 
walkers and other users of, of the uh, South River Road to move safely, to safely get past this curve with a steep ditch and a very narrow sh shoulder. From a very young age, um, that is the age of our children, Lynn and I taught our children that they had about three seconds to cross the road at our driveway. We lived just uh, two houses um, east of this woodlot. So they had three seconds before a car coming around that curve would arrive at our driveway. Now we teach our grandchildren the same lesson. Our number two recommendation to you is to restore the health of this woodland. This was a statement made in the LPAT of 2018. And uh, it was stated in that uh, paragraph 140 from the LPAT that despite its current state, the tribunal heard that management efforts would be taken to restore the health of this woodland. This woodlot, woodlot should be restored to health. Why hasn't the woodlot been restored to health? This uh, woodlot it's no surprise that it's referred to as a degraded woodlot. Um, that's what it was referenced as in the, the LPAT uh, report. That's one minute. Pardon me? You have one minute. Okay. Um, block 11 does indeed front a very unique in fact, historical property containing two ha historical two houses with heritage value. We're going to have to move forward. I'll have to give these up. Keep moving. This one. Um, the the LPAT report um, really complemented, in, in particular, um, um, David who just presented on his presentation and his sketch that sh showed that lots uh, placed on uh, further back on the lot or to the side clearly shows that there would, was likely to be a significant variety of lot areas and configurations. Um, and truly this Block 11 is unique, in fact, containing historical properties, the two houses with heritage qualities. The slope will provide unique placement of streets and a challenge, as we just heard. The flatter zone, however, at the back of Block 5 has many large trees for unique building lots. This development deserves a transitional feature that a healthy wood lot in Block 5 can provide. Thank you. That's actually 10 minutes. Um, we have your presentation included in our agenda as well. If anybody else would like to review his comments and his information that's in there, and it can be obtained on our website too. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for uh, your consideration, and uh, thanks for listening. Okay, thank you. I would like to call our second delegation up, and that's Doug Newman. Good evening okay. and welcome. We will be doing again 10 minutes for your talk, and All I'll right. give you a one minute I'll warning. I'll go fast, and I <laughs> okay. apologize if I go too fast, but uh, I'm here representing myself and my wife and our family. We all live on South River Road. We've lived there for 40 years. We oppose uh, the rezoning and we strongly encourage the council to oppose the rezoning and we oppose it for two simple reasons. Um, the applicants have provided really no justification for it and this zoning was settled years ago and it shouldn't be brought up again. Nothing has changed with regards to the property, the zoning, the needs of the community. Nothing should be overturning the results of the mediation and the LPAT hearings and conclusions. 
Just a bit of background. This subdivision was highly contentious years ago. It went to the, an LPAD hearing. The council or township opposed, did not approve the plan. The county did not approve the plan. They withheld it. And through mediation at, at the OMB and through an LPAD hearing, that's how the zoning was determined. Um, and the zoning was determined for both the properties, not in isolation. And I'm gonna quote heavily from the LPAT findings from Mr. Swinton, who was the chair. The development applications went through a number of iterations since the time of the original filing until the arrival at the tribunal for this hearing. In fact, quite dramatic changes occurred in the layout of the internal road network and the development blocks. The draft plans and zoning bylaw amendments which were before the tribunal were largely the product of the mediation exercise which took place in the fall of 2017 and the follow-up technical studies to support the negotiated development concept which were completed as recently as the turn of 2018. Block 11 which we're talking about tonight is the development block they're referring to and I'm again quoting from the findings there are three park blocks park blocks proposed as well as the area designated as core greenlands the latter of which is to function as an open space block i'm going to repeat it it's to, it, it's the only block in the whole subdivision that's a treat block nothing has changed and it was never ever referred to as a significant wood block it was one development and everybody agreed on it mr swinton for the purposes of the hearing and for the purposes of this decision, the two parcels were treated as linked and effectively a unified development proposal. Indeed, as will be evident in the reasons for the decision which follow, the stormwater management facility, the groundwater system, as well as the re internal road neck presume a common development platform. So, Block 11 was agreed by all parties and ratified by the decision of the LPAT to serve as one of the few and small, but one of the only open green spaces in this entire development. Again, from the decision. And Mr. Aston, in his presentation, in his own words in the presentation, it says Block 11 is an open space block which was planned to accommodate the retention of the existing wooded area on the Youngblood property as compensation and a restorative plantings. It was never meant to be a corridor. So the one justification that's being proposed is more efficient design. This is not an issue for council. It's certainly an issue for a developer, but it's not an issue for council. If, des if efficient design was a criteria, you'd write all your bylaws off the books, I'd still be allowed to dump garbage in the Grand River. Your job is for long-term planning, building healthy communities. And for God's sake, we need some little pieces of green space. I can't fault the developers. Their view is short-term, transactional, that's fine. But you need to balance that view. At the hearings, Mr. Aston, er, Mr. Aston claimed a significant variety of lot areas and configurations so that this portion of the development will be truly unique, and he was complimented. The creation of less conventional lotting and preservation of natural features in these circumstances of better realizing official and provincial poly goals is to be applauded. It, there was not a design issue back then. So in the absence of any other changes to the property in the zoning you can't bring up e efficiency of design now to justify eliminating a woodlot and this is the part that gets my blood boiling this hocus pocus it's there's a you've got a great environmental report in there where they go through pages and pages of what a, a significant woodlot is and they use provincial standards for a significant woodlot it was never intended to be a significant woodlot their environmental ex expert at the time. The tribunal accepts, accepts the evidence of Mr. Stevenson that qualitatively this woodland, and I'm referring to block 11, is degraded. And in that, in spite of the size of the woodland, it is a relevant factor to take into account when approaching this natural feature. Despite its current state, it was degraded then, the tribunal heard 
that management efforts would be taken to restore the health of woodland. Yeah, they haven't lived up to their commitments. So you can't reward them by shrinking it, allowing them to put bigger lots on it now. You, it, it's, it's analogous to developers when they go in and let a heritage property degrade, and then, oh, geez, I guess we've got to tear it down because it's not safe anymore. It, it's almost scandalous. So the issue at hand is not whether this woodlot meets the definition of a significant woodlot, but it's the importance of having some sort of green space as we develop this community. The developments are getting more and more dense. You don't have room for trees anymore in boulevards. You need some green space. And I'm not going to let you in that. I'm sure you all know about it. But the designation of this tiny little block as a green space was never in dispute. Mr. Swinton, the tribunal heard evidence that there was consensus among these persons on the questions on the delineation er, of the Greenland area. The tribunal has not been provided any sound basis on which to reject that consensus. And you have no evidence to reject that consensus now when you make your decision. There was none then and there's none now. So this is the section I titled Respect and Honor. And this is why council needs to reject the zoning application. The applicants have not provided any reasonable justification for the zoning. Efficiency is not a reason. It's not in the public interest. The current zoning was not based on it being a significant woodlot. You can't throw it out. This thing of defining it as a woodlot and then saying it doesn't meet the criteria of a woodlot, so let's get rid of it, makes no sense. And the prime reason for this little split, it was supposed to be compensation and restorative plantings. So my question to the applicants are going to be, now that the site's been stripped and houses are built, if this is not going to be where the restorative planting is going to be, where the hell is it going to be? You can't, once, you just, it it's, makes no sense. The zoning was determined through lengthy, thousands of hours, hundreds of thousands of dollars went into this. It just makes no sense to change it now. There's been no changes to the rest of the development. The ca or township didn't require anything. It, and my last reason is, is the credibility of, you need to say no just for the credibility of council and the planning process. You, people, you need to, re, townships planning staff put a lot of effort into the mediation and the planning. Respect what they've done. This is what was agreed to. They put effort into it. You know, a lot of us maybe aren't happy with this giant subdivision, but you know, it's not bad. You know, what they came up with is a reasonable compromise and that's what it should be. And the honor part is the applicants need to honor the commitments they made when this was done. They, they were supposed to restore the woodland. You can't use an argument now that, oh, we should get rid of the woodland because we didn't restore it. It makes no sense. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, and if I can call our next registered delegation, um, Bruce Youngblood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Good evening. Members of the committee. So I'll just do a reminder, 10 minutes, and I'll give a one-minute warning. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the purpose for registering myself as a delegation was that we were not clear that I would be given an opportunity to address any questions that came up. Uh, in light of the, the uh, format that's here, uh, I might uh, in, invite uh, David Aston to join me uh, to respond to most of these questions. But before doing that, I would like to just clarify one thing or a couple of uh, smaller points, and we'll address the more detailed uh, uh, items that came up in the presentations. Uh, there was a bit of uh, math miscommunication in the previous two uh, uh, presentations, and that is that uh, what was identified as woodland was 1.38 hectares, and the proposal before you is approximately 1.1 hectares. So there's a rather small reduction in the, um, in the area that is to be considered. The configuration is different, but the overall area is 
being diminished by a relatively small percentage. Uh, the other th uh, question that was coming up it was the rehabilitation. And uh, this is the attempt to do that rehabilitation. We haven't had the opportunity to do that until we got into further analysis, and that was verified through the environmental impact study that was prepared as part of the step of moving forward into uh, the initiative that's before this committee tonight. So we are attempting to complete that section of it. And in the interim time period, there has in fact been substantial continuing degradation, degradation of that area. It has been uh, identified as an ecological desert by the environmentalists, by the ecologists, uh, and that was confirmed by the township peer review. So what we have is essentially a dead ecosystem existing uh, in this patch of, of uh, treed area at this point in time. And the reason for that, it is approximately 90% occupied with non-native and invasive species. The, uh, the approach here is to delineate what we have remove the non-native and invasive species, and then create through the work of an ecologist and an arborist a functioning, working, environmental uh, area that is not there today. Uh, it's, it's hazardous the way it is, and it needs to be addressed, and that's, again, what we are attempting to do. Uh, the, I want to stress that the native trees that exist within the area, inclusive of the existing defined area, will be retained. So we're not proposing to remove any native trees whatsoever, but to build upon that existing inventory with uh, acceptable and appropriate plantings of trees, shrubs, and grasses that are all native. So with that, Mr. Aston might uh, want to address some of the uh, specifics that uh, relate back to the LPAT hearing. Okay. Actually, um, we will have him come back up afterwards. We will have to put a, a call out for any more delegates that would okay. like to speak to this. Fine. Thank you. Do you have time. anything else to continue with? Or? Not unless I uh, would be recalled to answer a question okay. a little bit later. Thank Alrighty. you. Thank you very much. All right, so with that, um, if there's anybody else in the room that uh, hasn't registered as a delegation for this evening, if they would like to come forward, is there any? You would like to come up? Great. Welcome. Hi. I'm going to ask for your name for the record. Jane Newman. Okay. Um, I've heard a couple things that um, I, the way I read it is number four point presented by the planner. This would make for an efficient construction of area 11, means clear cutting. Clear cutting in the west, you know what that is. This would be clear cutting of that area. And when I saw the drawing up there, I have no idea how they're saying they're only changing 0.2 acres. When you look at the area of 5 and 11, you can look with your thingamajigs that fly over top. You're welcome to walk through there. So I, I'm just not sure of what's being presented. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to come forward to speak to this application? Okay. So seeing none, um, I'm not sure, Dave Aston, if you would like to come to respond, give you a chance to speak to the delegations. Great, thanks for the opportunity. And I will just respond to a couple of the comments and maybe clarify. Um, 
there was a question about removals, and uh, I, I, I can advise that the removals that occurred in relation to the plans of subdivision were all approved uh, as part of the uh, township final approval for the plans of subdivision. And those were based on the reports that were prepared and submitted to address those conditions of approval. Uh, there was environmental impact statements and tree management plans that were prepared and supported for review and consideration. So uh, removals are, uh, have been approved. I just want to clarify, there was mention of core green lands. Uh, the area that we're discussing is not core green lands, it's green lands. And there is a difference between those two types of designations within the county official plan. Uh, one is a higher level than the other uh, based on different, you know, core green lands, for example, is a, a provincially significant wetland. Uh, this is a green lands that relates to woodlands. Uh, there was a comment about that the proposal identified three parks and an open space block. Uh, what I'd suggest to you is that's still the same proposal. Uh, there's, yes, we're asking for a refinement of the open space block, but that hasn't changed. The uh, park blocks are still as approved by the LPAT. Uh, those have been registered, and I believe the park blocks have actually been conveyed to the township. And the, there were two open space blocks. There's an open space block that we're discussing this evening on the Youngblood property. Then there is also an open space block um, on the haylock lands that are the trees that remain on the haylock lands uh, that was discussed. Uh, the proposed trail location uh, that was shown in the photo with the hydro corridor, if you recall on my slide, that is in an area where uh, the, the vegetation is proposed to be retained. Uh, so that uh, is something that I just wanted to identify. Uh, there was a comment on clear cutting uh, with regard to uh, all of the references to uh, the LPAT decision in Block 11. Uh, there were principles of development that were established that, that need to be followed. And one of them was to work to try and retain existing trees within that block, uh, which, as, as you can understand, relates to location of a driveway, location of homes, understanding of the grading and the topography. And the intent is still to create a block in that area that is unique to anything else within the plans of subdivision. And that was the discussion. Uh, so still to have a private road, plan a condominium, single detached homes that would have varying lot sizes, different than your, the plan of subdivision that you see, varying types of homes. And so that's still the intent of that block. And what happens with the grading um, is that the kind of shift in the block will allow for ability to more efficiently grade that, that block. There'll still be a slope back down to that corridor that could be planted uh, and support that corridor. Uh, just a couple other things. There was some discussion on uh, and, a, and a note to uh, to you to suggest that efficient design and and consideration of land use isn't really a, uh, a planning matter. I just suggest to you that it is. The PPS specifically has a policy that relates to development and consideration of development within settlement areas and the efficient use of land. Um, so I think those were just the things that I picked up on, I don't know if there's other questions uh, that you think that I've missed, but I'd be happy to respond to those. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to questions from council, and then if anybody noticed anything that the delegations had mentioned that we did miss, then we can just do a little reminder and he can maybe answer. Um, so we'll start at this side of the horseshoe this time. Um, Councillor Craddock? Well, I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Adams? To you, Deputy Mayor. 
Um, I guess just more of a comment than a question. Um, I'm not going to pretend to know more about this than you all have. This you guys have been <laughs> working on this a long time, and there is a lot to take in here. I would say that I'm still a little bit confused, and and when this comes back to council, I would like to s understand more about the need f for this for a more efficient um, development pattern. I'm still trying to kind of figure that out. Um, you know, we do hear about increasing density and stuff, but it, that's not the case here. So I'm still just a little confused with the application here. Um, and I, uh, one of the actual quotes, I think it was from the LPAT decision, really spoke to me. Um, and it was like, healthy acti active communities are to be promoted by planning public streets, spaces, and facilities to be safe, meet the needs of pedestrians, foster social interaction, and facilitate active transportation and community con connectivity. Um, that really speaks to me and why I got involved um, as a counselor. And I hope that um, in future applications, we kind of hear more about um, the vision from the developer and how the connection to trails and, and you know, not the recommended replacement of trees, but what the tree, like what is going to be done, like what the commitments are going to be made versus like recommended or perhaps or things like that, just a little bit more. Anyway, that's just my comment. Thank you. Councillor Eboy. Thank you to you, Madam Deputy. I have a question, and again, I there's a lot here, and, and I apologize if I missed or misunderstood. I heard comments about making sure we don't remove any uh, any native species trees but I heard another comment saying there's a lot of non-native so do we have a percentage so we can get a picture of how many trees will actually be removed or percentage wise through madam chair uh, percentage I'm sure we can get that information I'm just gonna look back to Bruce he knows more than me about uh, the, the trees but um, we do have information that, that can clarify that on the native versus non-native. And I think before, Bruce, the one thing we're looking at is the ability to save native trees in both, both of the blocks as being the first priority. Uh, through the chair, I believe that, that you said we will not be removing any native. Is that correct? Did I hear that right? I wrote That's it down. That's correct, yes. Okay. yes. To, to answer that more fully, uh, we're at the stage, once we get through this process, to get into that detailed tree inventory. I can say with great certainty that fully 85 to probably 90% of the tree population within the area we're talking about are non-native and invasive. So uh, to answer that, clearly there's going to be very few trees that exist today remaining when we rehabilitate. And the problem is that the non-native, the Scots pine predominantly, are dying out. And as they die out, they open the canopy and the European buckthorn are just devastating the area. So this is what has to be done. We kind of got to weed the garden before we can make it good again. So. Uh, must have no delusion. There's very little. There's almost nothing there now. And if we were to advance this two years from now, those trees will be dead, and we will be back to that approximate 10%, maybe 15%. That has not been fully identified, but it's substantially just not um, uh, a functioning anything at the moment. And that's what we're trying to correct. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, as, as a follow-up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Youngblood. So, uh, again, I apologize if I missed it. Is there an absolute, what percentage of trees do you plan to replant? Like, so, so we're, I'm hearing we're going to lose roughly 85 to 90 percent of the current tree, uh, and I understand the reasoning behind it 100 percent. Is there a plan, or have you guys got a plan only because I'm hearing what the residents are saying again sure. new to the table about promises not being kept before uh, is there a plan to re regarden as you say yes. Re yes. and can you give us an idea what that looks like Bruce? I think the residences 
residents and myself share a common concern and goal there. Uh, the intent of the rehabilitation uh, is to provide a screen both from South River Road onto the property and conversely from for the residences that will be future residences from their uh, residences onto South River Road. So we have a common goal there. Uh, as to the density, I would have to defer to the experts, but certainly to create a visual and functioning screen. There, there's two aspects. One, we want to create a visual screen, so that suggests that there's going to be a robust population of different types of, of herbage in there. And the second part of it is to create the ecological factor that is not there presently. So we're we're wanting to bring back something that is missing. Uh, it perhaps was there at some time in the past, but we've learned through um, a lot of advanced studies from the University of Guelph. Um, 20 years ago, we weren't hearing about non-native trees are bad. In fact, they were on the plant list for Center Wellington. They're not on the planting list anymore. We have learned that's not what we need to be planting. So here we are, full cycle, let's get on to replanting with native. And that's the intent of what we're doing. So I want to assure you there will be a robust program in place. We want to provide that screen both to and from the site. So that objective is a common goal for the residents and ourselves. Okay, Mayor Waters. Uh, thank you. Um, just maybe a bit of continuity because um, I, I've sort of been around this issue for a long time. This was a very contentious issue in our, our community and uh, and uh, a lot of folks that lived along South River Road were uh, diametrically opposed to the development. Uh, obviously there was a lot of money spent on LPAT. Uh, our township was there, we spent a lot of money. Uh, folks within the community spent my money on it and uh, and obviously the development group spent my money on it so there was a, a very I think a very robust and thorough conversation going on on through that I don't quite understand sort of why weren't some of these discussions at the table at the time and so they're coming back after the fact you know and and I don't I don't um, I don't disregard sort of I take uh, you know, decisions that come out of LPAT uh, very seriously in terms of that. There seemed to be, uh, obviously, you know, it was contentious, and but it came out of LPAT, and it seemed at the time that we kind of, everyone kind of resolved everything and we moved forward. So I can, I can really appreciate the frustration of the community uh, having sort of some understanding that this is where we are with the LPAT, this is where the decision, this development's going to go forward, but it was based on those decisions. I can appreciate uh, the hyper, I can appreciate the conversation in terms of the uh, the quality of the trees, that type of thing. But if that was such a significant or important part of that, that should have been discuss discussed in the past, mm -hmm. and those should have been part of that decision. I find it very difficult after sort of uh, knowing where this came through and understanding where the public was to sort of revisit this issue as it relates to sort of realignment and sort of like, well, either they got it right or they got it wrong or we want to change this thing because we don't think that the, it was a good enough decision. Regardless of what our, our abilities to think whether it was a good decision or not, that was a decision that came out of LPAT. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's like we need, I think, and we need to run in our lanes, and I, I'm speaking to council here, we need to run in our lanes, understand what those decisions were at LPAT, and look at those and take those things seriously as opposed to going back and relitigating this again. That's my concern about this, regardless of the quality of the tree, of that type of thing. So I will leave it at that. Thank you, Mayor Waters. Um, Councillor McDonald. Through you, Deputy Mayor Jefferson. Uh, I, first of all, I want to thank you for coming. And, and I want to thank all the delegates for coming too. It was a lot of information, fast information, um, uh, I read this over several times before coming tonight. Um, as, as someone who has adjudicated things in the past, uh, as a person who uh, has a background uh, with um, 
biodiversity. Um, I just, I have a question. Uh, in, in all this information about looking at the land and the trees, and I do question that it's not a wetland. Um, I know there's deer in there. I know that there's, because I've seen them when I'm out biking. I know that there's barn owls. I've seen, I've seen a nest. Um, so I just ask uh, where animals are concerned, I think we have to consider that too. Um, I don't see any of that in the information. I understand you did environmental studies, but I just have to put that out there, you know, um, in the studies. Did they find a salamander? Did they find anything that could be at risk by removing these trees? Uh, so that's my first question. Okay. <laughs> Th through you, Madam Chair, through all the previous studies, uh, there was no... Um, significant wildlife or okay. or habitat f found um, with regard to uh, that area so the so the environmental impact studies as it relates to the subdivision didn't identify significant wildlife habitat in the context of you know, okay. how that's addressed under the the required guidelines for okay. completion of an EIS Okay, and can I just zone in again on the amount of land that, is it 0.2 that we're looking at? Or because I've, I've heard a few different numbers now tonight compared to the information that I've received. Yeah, through you, Madam Chair, what we'll do to clarify for everyone is there's um, uh, calculation and looks different on the slide because there's some area where we're removing and there's some area where we're adding. So what we can do for uh, the next step is provide to, uh, to everyone a clear map that calculates the areas that are changing to respond to that question as far as what's changing as far as removal or addition mm -hmm. for an overall total. Okay. Okay. And um, I think that's all I have, uh, but I appreciate uh, you coming here tonight. And I, I do want to mention one thing, sorry, through you, Deputy Mayor Jefferson, if I could have some leeway. Um, uh, one of the delegates proposed a way to do the trail. Uh, you know, I'm just sort of looking at a solution you know, this is definitely along mediation lines here, and I'm looking at a solution. Um, we're passionate about our trails in this community, and so um, I'd like to see some some changes there. But yeah, through yeah. you, Madam Chair, on on the trail, um, that's not really a discussion we've had at all with with township staff on looking at that corridor as far as an opportunity for a trail connection. And maybe that's where, when we talk about the opportunity for this corridor to become um, township ownership, is that that trail would then be part of that corridor in context of those lands owned by the township. So we, we haven't assessed that, um, and we haven't really discussed that with township staff, staff either. So that's something that we'll endeavor to do. Okay, any other questions from councillors? No? We're good? Okay. Okay, um, can I ask who you'd like to ask a question to? Okay, I'll have you come up to the microphone, please. Is it a question of clarification? Uh, just a question of how did we arrive at the 30 meters? Okay, can I get your name for record? Sure. Thank you. Cecil Bowman. Okay, alrighty. And your question, you would like to direct it back to Dave as well? Okay. Uh, this way? Sorry, microphone. Oh, and can we get you to turn it on there? Your microphone. Thank you. So the 30 meters, it's just my question. Where, where did that number come from? What exactly does that mean? And why is it 30 meters, not 40, not 50? Well, 
what, what is the significance of 30 meters? Thank you. Madam Chair, that, uh, that 30 meters was a collaboration of the ecologist to uh, uh, understand that that provided enough depth or um, density uh, to meet the test of, of creating uh, a functioning environmental uh, corridor. Uh, the 30 meters was also um, determined to be sufficient to provide the visual screening that we're uh, looking at uh, creating here. Uh, it also functions into, in a third way, uh, Mr. Aston was speaking towards the efficient employment of the lands. And uh, so by yielding up the area that is to be removed and readjusted uh, in large part uh, with a small deletion of area, um, allowed for the more efficient application of the rest of the land. So it, it had three parts in the analysis to arrive at 30 meters. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Is it a question for the applicant? I'd like to... Okay. Good evening. I'm Lynn Kramer. Okay. I guess I, I would hope that all of you here on council, whether I had a question or a statement, would want to hear what I have to say. Mm -hmm. As a, a member, a person who's lived 40 years on the South River Road, and I really appreciated your comments, Mr. Waters. We put over two years, many hours, much thought, much love into trying to cooperate with the development of a subdivision on our road that we loved and have lived in and raised our family. We thought that we were working with our council at the time. At the end of the day, when the final decision was made, we truly felt that the council, our former mayor, threw us under the bus. And it wasn't a nice feeling. I listened tonight to the presenters who want this change to happen. And I hear more of the same nonsense we as listened to before. And my question might be to Mr. Youngblood. As soon as that subdivision was approved, Mr. Youngblood was very busy in the woodlots along his property cutting down trees and we were concerned about that we did hear that he had his hand slapped and was told you're not supposed to be doing that i wonder how many of those trees were tagged and there were a lot you talk about the wildlife do you know the joy that we have had i can show you videos we've taken of the wildlife that have come through that woodlot that we're discussing here tonight. Across our neighbor Maria's property, across our property, up our hill, we've taken photographs, we've fed them, we've put blocks of salt out for them. The birds, the wildlife, you don't live on South River Road and love it like we do if you can say there's no threat to the wildlife because there is. And Mr. Waters, I thank you so much. And I thank my husband, Eugene, and my good neighbor, Doug. You have no idea how many hours, on top of what we've already given, what they've put in to say to you, this is important to us. And I agree with Doug and Eugene, this was settled. We put off renovations in our house to contribute to the OMB hearing. We couldn't afford to do the renovation and, con and contribute, so we decided to contribute to that hearing. This is important to the people in this community. We are the people who live here. And I really implore you with all my heart to show the people of Alora that you care about our lives here. 
I have said to Eugene so many times, or asked him, do you think they're going to wait until I'm killed on this street, coming out of my driveway, before they slow down the speed? We moved our, our mailbox from across the road to the smart box down the hill because I was really concerned going out to get my mail. You could check the speed and you can give me an average speed of drivers along that road. It would not tell you what goes on on that road. The average speed might be 65. But that does not include the people who I'm sure are going at least 80, 90 kilometers an hour speeding down that road during the day, during the night, 10 o'clock when I'm trying to sleep. I can hear the sound. I know where the vehicle's going. Right now, the speed has been reduced in front of the subdivision. It speeds up just before the bend in my road. The bookend at my end, there's a bookend at the other end, the other major curve in that road. In between those bookends, it's 60 kilometers an hour. What do you do when you go from a 40 to a 60? You speed up, right? So just before my driveway now, because of the change in the speed, cars are going to speed up even more. My children have been blown off their bikes as young children because people sped down our road. I implore you with all my heart, and again, Mr. Waters, I thank you for the courage to stand up before everyone gathered in this room and to say, the people of Alora, the people of South River Road matter. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Okay. So it, would you like a response? Uh, there is very much in, in Lynn's address, so there's only one point that I, I feel I like can properly address, and that is there is a suggestion that I was cutting down trees that had been tagged, etc., and that's simply not the case. Uh, I did, uh, at, as uh, the Kramers had raised the issue with the township, I invited the township arborist to the site. He and I walked the property together and he provided communication back to assure the township that I was not removing trees. There were two trees that did come down that were dead ash trees. Uh, they were not tagged. Uh, the township has taken a very ambitious approach to getting their ash trees down, alive or dead, and I called out to uh, ash trees that were quite dead and becoming quite dangerous. So that's the only trees that have been removed uh, from the LPAT decision until this very day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Alrighty. So with that, I want to thank everybody for attending for our public meeting too. No, I'm sorry. We've done our time for this. And I'm going to advise that council will be considering the bylaw at a future council meeting. And with that, I'm going to declare our second public meeting adjourned. We're just going to take a recess for five minutes.
Alrighty, so we're going to move on to our public meeting number three for this evening, and we are going to call that meeting to order. The purpose of this meeting is to present and receive public input regarding a proposed zoning bylaw amendment on the subject land known as 7450 Middlebrook Road in the former township of Pilkington. The purpose of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is to change the current zoning of the property from A, Agricultural and EP, Environmental Protection, to A, Agricultural Exception and EP, Environmental Protection. The effect of the amendment is to allow a seasonal special events venue and a sales outlet for agricultural products in the existing barn as an on-farm business for agritourism. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at the public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of Centre Wellington before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Township of Centre Wellington to the Ontario Land Tribunal, the OLT. If a person or public body does not make oral submission at the public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of Centre Wellington before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body may not be added as the party to the hearing of an appeal before the OLT unless, in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. If anyone wished to be notified of the adoption of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, a written request must be filed with the... What? What? with the municipal clerk okay. at the Township of Centre Wellington, 1 Macdonald Square, Allure, Ontario, N0B1S0. And at this time, I'm going to ask the municipal clerk to advise how notice was given. Uh, thank you. Through you, um, notice was mailed to prescribed persons, agencies, and public bodies on March the 2nd, 2023. A copy was also placed in the Wellington Advertiser on March the 2nd, 2023. I can therefore confirm the requirement for giving notice was completed on March the 2nd, 2023. Thank you, Carrie. And now I will call on, is it Allie? Clark and Trevor Hawkins from MHBC Planning Consultants to provide an overview of this application. Thanks and good evening. Uh, Trevor Hawkins, Aaliyah is with me in the audience, but there's only room for one of us up here. And also with me this evening are the owners, uh, Melinda and Tim Croft, and I know Melinda is going to speak after me. Um, the, the, I'm not used to using one of these, but um, the picture in front of uh, council this evening is of the barn on the property, and that, as you will hear, is going to be the focus of a lot of the things I talk about and we can see from the barn that it's a very old barn and uh, part of the submission that we provided to the township was a heritage impact assessment. So there is some um, heritage aspects related to the barn use as well. The, the lands in question are outlined in red and they're just outside the urban boundary which we can uh, make out in the black dashed line. So the urban center boundary for Laura Salem kind of runs along one side of the property and and then all the way down the road on the other side of the property. Uh, so we're just on the edge of the boundary, and we can see from this image that there's a few different pieces of the property. It might be easier for me to look over here and see it a bit better, but there's a, a farmed area on the right at the corner of the two roads, and then there's a, a sort of an area in the middle of the site that has uh, environmental features, the house, the barn, the driveway, the carport, uh, a parking area that's all existing. And then on the other side of the barn, sort of the west side, on the uh, west uh, frontage of uh, Middlebrook is another farmed area, and that's also the area where the greenhouse is located, and there's a driveway that goes from the barn area around the sort of treed area that we can see to the west side of the site to access the greenhouse. And then, of course, across the other side of the street uh, is the conservation area, and then in behind the site there is some existing uh, farming operations, and then there's also some lands within the urban center designation that are planned and zoned for uh, commercial and, and residential uses. Some images to orient council to what's on the site today. So the top left image is the barn as we're sort of coming up the driveway so the, the property slopes so the lower level of the barn is accessible from the south side of the barn face and you can see there's a driveway that goes up and around as the property slopes to the opposite side of the barn which is the top right. So we can see in this, in this image the sliding doors on the north side of the barn as well as the driveway that goes around the barn 
across, uh, well, across sort of in between some of the environmental features and that driveway provides access to the greenhouse, which is on the lower left, and the apiaries uh, and some of the other farming that takes place on the west side of the site. And then there's another image to show that there's some of the, some of the property uh, closer to the urban center and, and the uh, Wellington Road 7 and Middlebrook intersection is also farmed. Um, the, the, the really, the, the summary of the proposal can be encapsulated in, in those two bullet points, which we can see there. The intent is to seek a zoning bylaw amendment, maintain the agricultural zoning, no changes to the uh, environmental protection zoning so that that zoning would remain. Uh, and the intent is to allow two specific uses within the existing barn. No expansion to the barn, no changes in that regard. The changes would all occur inside the barn as opposed to additions or, or that nature related to the barn. And one of them would be a, a special events venue that would take place uh, in the upper portion of the barn. And then the second request is for a sales outlet. Because of the nature of the size of the property, the bylaw re requires that we seek a site-specific uh, relief to allow the sales outlet, so to sell things that are produced on the farm. And our request is that 25% uh, of that space also be allowed for products that are produced by other um, others that grow things or make things in the community. But uh, most of that space would be used for things that are produced on site. This is a, a conceptual site plan. It's a very busy plan, and I apologize. I didn't do it. The architect did. Um, but it, it has a lot of lines on it. But essentially what, uh, what it, it shows is the driveway that exists today that leads um, from Middlebrook into the site the house on the right-hand side, the carport existing on the left-hand side of the driveway. There's a little parking area just north of the carport, and you continue up the driveway, and then you see the barn in the dark gray. There's a concrete area uh, at the lower level of barn. We saw that in, in one of the er earlier pictures. So that all exists. The driveway that goes up and around the barn, we saw that in one of the other pictures, goes across sort of between the pinch point of those two environmental, the, sort of the darker green areas we see on the plan and carries you around to the other side where we see the greenhouse and a shed. So that, all of that stuff essentially exists today. The, chain, the, the, the real change um, uh, on the site that would occur is the, the loop, the loop around the house where you could then turn around and leave the site without going all the way around to the parking area. Uh, and that, a lot of that has to do with providing um, fire access to the site and, and building code and fire code related things. Uh, and then the, the parking area, which we're showing on the opposite side, the west side of the, of the feature. Um, so that area now is not farmed. Um, it's, just, it's really the access point to, to get in and out of the greenhouse, and it would be converted into a, a parking area for the, the two uses. Um, there's a lot of information on this slide, but I want to sort of uh, summarize it in, in that there's policies in the provincial policy statement that speak to prime agricultural uh, areas, uh, and then they uh, speak to guidelines that the province may release. So this, this sort of, uh, rather than uh, pulling up the PPS and, and referencing the specific mm -hmm. slide, we're going right to the, the guidelines, which are really what talk or, or talk about and what uh, direct the consideration of on-farm diversified uses. So in this case, uh, we, we have more details in our planning justification report, and I certainly would encourage council to refer to that. But what I wanted to touch on um, in this slide is that there's no changes being made to any of the areas that are being farmed. So there's no lands being taken out of farm uh, production. It's all, um, it's all remaining, and all of the, the changes are what I uh, summarized on the, on the site plan earlier. The new parking area is, is in an area that's not farmed, and it already uh, has a driveway that accesses the greenhouse. Um, the farm still, other than the environmental features on the site, the, the farm occupies the majority of the site outside the features. Um, the, the, the guidelines speak to, and, and perhaps councils uh, heard this many times, but the 2% target of, of when you have a farm and you're <coughs> producing or, or requesting an on-farm on diversified use, the intent is that you keep your space related to the on-farm diversified use to 2% or less. So we were very cognizant of that uh, guideline, and we've come in under it at 1.98%, uh, and that includes the parking area plus the area within the barn that would be um, for the uh, event center use. Um, and again, those, those uses are self-contained. 
Um, we've done a, a traffic study, and I'll, I'll summarize those a little bit later, but we've done the traffic study and a noise study to evaluate the impact of those uses as well as the environmental work to make sure that the, uh, the parking area in particular uh, wouldn't impact the features on the site. In terms of the, the county's official plan, the lands are designated uh, prime agricultural, core greenlands and greenlands. We heard about, heard about core greenlands and greenlands earlier uh, this evening. So this site, which uh, you can just see that the, the sort of the water feature, and then there's an area at the very top of the site that uh, forms the core greenlands, and then the lighter green is the greenlands. There's no changes being requested and no uh, development within those areas. And uh, the environmental impact study has evaluated the, the development in consideration of those policies. In terms of the zoning bylaw, the lands are zoned agriculture, they're zoned environmental protection, and then there's the uh, environmental protection overlay. So the overlay triggers the need <coughs> for the environmental impact uh, study, and the environmental impact study also looks at the environmental protection zone, or the core greenlands in this case, to ensure that whatever is being proposed is appropriate and not impacting the features. So that was what we undertook as part of our uh, development application in this case. So just a bit of uh, commentary on the, on the township zoning bylaw, particularly as it relates to the sales outlet. So the sales outlet is permitted on slightly larger farm parcels, 10 hectares, whereas this, this property is just under seven hectares. So that's sort of the nature of why we're requesting that particular use. And then the sort of detailed part of that specific use is to allow a small, small percentage of that space to be uh, able to sell products that are produced by other farmers or, or those that make and grow products in the area. Again, the EP overlay uh, triggered the need for the uh, environmental impact study, which has been submitted to the township, the county, and the Grand River Conservation Authority. And we would work with uh, all three of those to ensure that uh, they're satisfied with the submission. This is uh, just highlighting the nature of the request and sort of the more uh, nuts and bolts of the zoning application request and the bylaw as it would be uh, presented for consideration. So the lot area, again, is just to recognize the existing uh, size of the lot, uh, maximum area for the special events venue, uh, which reflects sort of the second floor of the barn, and then there's a, there's a mezzanine already in the barn, so it's that second floor plus a small mezzanine area that overlooks the, the second floor. Um, that that use only be permitted within the barn, and we've included a definition of what that would entail. So um, that definition is similar to another definition that council approved for uh, another similar use um, elsewhere. Um, so we've we've tried to sort of encapsulate what what would be involved in the special events uh, venue, so that it's understood um, both by council and, and certainly by staff when they're reviewing the you know, subsequent applications for building permit and those kinds of things, they know what the special events venue uh, would, would be. And then the, the seasonal nature of it, so we're encapsulating that in the bylaw, so it's, it's intended to be seasonal in nature, so in terms of the, the calendar year, but also um, in, intermittent in terms of its use. The intent is that it would be used on weekends as opposed to seven days a week. Um, and occupancy, uh, again, that would be, of course, evaluated separately through the building code and the fire code, but the intent is to also uh, capture that in the zoning bylaw. Uh, and then the, the, the sales outlet component I alluded to earlier, so permission for the sales outlet, and then to allow 25% of that lower floor to be used for um, the sale of products that aren't made on the site or produced on the site. And then to ensure that there's sufficient amount of parking, um, a, a minimum amount of parking for the, for the use. This is just a schedule just to show sort of the, the nature of the request and what it would apply to. Uh, again, sh no change to the underlying zoning, the EP, the EP overlay, or the agriculture. They would all remain. It would just be a site specific in this case. Just to touch on the, the studies that we prepared and submitted in support of the application. So the traffic study was um, prepared to, to ensure that the, the uh, Middlebrook Road and then uh, making your way out to uh, Wellington Road 7, there wouldn't be an impact on, on those roads as a result of the application. Uh, there was one recommendation in it that we would capture through site plan. There's some trees near where the driveway intersects with Middlebrook that may need to be uh, trimmed back to make sure that when you're exiting the site and you're looking 
towards uh, Wellington Road 7, you can see a suitable distance to make a safe exit from the property. That was the, the one recommendation that would need to be implemented. The uh, environmental impact study um, evaluated the application, um, the use, uh, and, and determined that the use was appropriate and that the features would be adequately protected. Um, the noise looked at what types of uh, events could occur within the barn because of the nature of the barn and the slats within the barn and the historic that historic part of the barn, uh, we wanted to ensure that the noise impacts on the adjacent properties would be uh, properly managed. And so there's a recommendation in there about uh, the level of the sound system that could be perhaps included within the barn and an upper limit to that sound system. And then the heritage impact uh, assessment was undertaken to evaluate the, sig the significance of the barn. It's a listed uh, non-designated property. It concluded that uh, it has uh, cultural heritage value and uh, importantly felt that the, uh, the proposed use uh, of the barn and the adaptive reuse of the barn would be a net benefit from a heritage perspective because it would uh, result in improvements and conservation and ongoing um, preservation of the barn. So just in summary, um, again, there's no, no land being taken out of farm production. The, the special events venues is seasonal and intermittent in nature. Um, it conforms with the county's official plan. It meets the guidelines uh, introduced by the province through the provincial policy statement. Um, the, the studies that were prepared in support of it have demonstrated from a technical perspective that it's appropriate. And uh, again, the, the heritage impact assessment concluded that the adaptive reuse of the barn was positive from uh, a heritage perspective. Thank you. Great, thank you. And now we do have a registered delegation to come forward, so I will call Melinda Croft. Hi, guys. <laughs> and I'm just going to remind that we have 10 minutes, and I'll give you a one minute warning. No problem. I printed large because getting older is hard to see. It's only three pages. Um, I just want to say thank you for allowing us to come speak. I'm not a public speaker, so I am going to read for this so I don't forget stuff. Um, but I did want you guys to take in consideration we're not a developer. This is our home. This is our farm. It's our property. It means a lot to us. It's my husband. We work the property. We live there. We're looking to do add an asset that we have that can help us generate a bit more income and we can live off of our farm. Okay. <laughs> um, so we were drawn to this community as a place to live because it's a part of the arts, history, culture, entrepreneurs, and small businesses. It also has abundance of beauty, which is obvious, <laughs> with the trails, the gorge, and two lovely towns. I grew up not too far from here, so we were incredibly happy to find this place when we did. We both come from the marketing industry, um, which is not really friendly to anyone over 40, <laughs> which was quite resonant when we moved here. My husband was let go after two months, um, so we really needed another plan. So um, we've leveraged, though, our marketing background to help us with other businesses and friends in the community, um, working with the Fergus BIA, Monster Month Laura, and now as a board member on RTO4. We bought the farm three and a half years ago. We're not farmers. We wanted a lifestyle that would be more meaningful and sustainable. Um, the property has really challenged us with its smaller size and uh, the limited farming area that we actually have. Um, we knew we'd have to be creative and find a crop that could provide a higher return. So we decided to grow flowers and produce. Um, we've had teachers come to get sunflowers to show kids how they grow, produce seeds. We've had artists come to paint them. Retirement homes and special needs groups have come um, to be outside and provide a safe space for them to enjoy the beauty. We have weekend travelers come to, and locals, to buy our flower varieties. We actually plant over 44 different sunflowers, so it's quite unique um, and special for us in the area. Um, florists, florists purchase them for their special occasions, and we also stock local shops with our flowers. When we brought the property, it required a lot of physical work, um, as, and we had a bit more than average because we needed to convert it from what was a hobby farm to an actual working farm. We removed over 50 poles from one field and put it back into crop. We built 200 raised beds last year to utilize an area that was mostly weeds to grow flowers and produce. 
We brought um, bees onto the property to produce honey and fix the greenhouse so we can start planting earlier next year. And we also, we don't cut a lot of our wildflowers. We have actually been planting more and we're the type of people that do not cut the milkweed because we want the butterflies. Um, we've also worked with Green Legacy to help us plant and provide us over 100 trees. We've lost a lot in our forest to the ash borer, which was devastating for us to find out that half of it was dead, but they've really helped us and we are those people that plant those trees. Um, we've also been working with um, this year, connecting with local um, security food groups, uh, food security groups, um, so that we can plan this year to plant more products and flowers because the price of produce, as we all know, has gone up and we want to make sure we can help provide that to the community as well as not have any waste. Um, the barn itself has been another story. <laughs> it requires a ton of work and even in the photos when you saw it, it's, it looks lovely, <laughs> but you can't see the insides. You can't see the fact that there were three pillars left to hold this massive barn up, um, but it really, really is beautiful. Um, it does require the work. The structure's taken a lot of damage and the deterioration over the years. When you add all the multiple owners and time itself, it's, it hasn't been that kind to it. Um, we've had a lot of people reach out who are interested in having an event in the barn. The Allura Singers want to perform. The Fergus High School wants to have their prom. The Guelph School of Dance wants to perform. The Allura Market, the Witches Ball, market organizers, painters, artists to do workshops, and private parties for weddings, anniversaries, and celebrations of life. Really, everyone has reached out in this community, and we hear so many really cool things. Um, if you, any of you have seen the barn and had the pleasure of coming to the property, it really is inspirational and it's unique and has a lot of potential. Allowing us to use the barn as a multi-use space would provide income security for our family, provide funds to preserve the barn, be able to afford equipment and staffing to help in our farming, in addition to our agricultural purposes. The top of the barn would provide another gathering space in the community. The rest of the upper space and the entire low part would be remain for our agricultural purposes. We'd like to be supported by our community and seen as a value add to the area that can provide another space to be able to host events and bring people together. We wanna to be part of the cultural diversity of what this area represents with our farm and our beautiful barn. We're big community supporters. I know some of you have seen us in the community, um, but we do support our local charities, small businesses, and other farms in the area. We're really big on connecting people to the farms, and because we're so centrally, so close located to town, it makes us really unique to do that. Um, we are constantly growing and learning about farming. We wanna keep the property as a working farm. We're not looking to take any field space away. We've actually increased it with our raised beds in an area that wasn't previously used. So we've increased the farmable area on the property. And it's our hope that the land remains as a farm for many years to come. We bought this property as our forever home. We love it, we take pride in it, and we wanna preserve it. We're simply asking to help us create a little bit more income and security for ourselves so that our hard work can sustain us on our farm. Thanks guys. Thanks. All done. <laughs> now I'm just going to ask if there's anybody else in the room that would like to speak to this application as a delegation. Okay, then I'm seeing none. All right. So we can move to questions. Okay, so we're going to move to questions from council. So then I can start with um, Councilor McDonald. Any questions? For I have no questions. Okay. Thank you. Mayor Waters? Nothing? Councillor Eboy. Oh, yes. Thank you through you, Madam Deputy. You know, I have been there many times. I've walked through the barn. I've walked through the area. I've walked through the grounds. I've seen the struggle with the where the parking is or isn't and should be. I've recognized that they've done the work, and I'm happy to say this. They've done the work to join community to local business, and that is exactly what I am always looking for. Not to mention they're involved in uh, Fergus BIA and have a business there. I personally just want to take a minute to celebrate. This is what I would like to see our community be doing more of. Thank you. Councillor Adams, question? Through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, no concerns, no questions. Um, maybe just a quick comment to staff, like how great would it be to have like a renovated ECC, have like a, a local business with like a nice safe pedestrian <laughs> crossing across there to get more access to the location. But yeah, no concerns with the application. Councillor Craddock. 
No questions or concerns. Thank you. Well, that was easy. There we go. <laughs> okay, so then I would like to thank everybody for attending this public meeting, and I will advise that Council will be considering the bylaw at a future Council meeting, and then I will declare this public meeting adjourned. There we go. Done.